What are we doing this week? Vapor Dynasty Expo? That's going on right now. We gotta go. Hold on, hold on, let's go. Sweet, pass it. Get out of my way! Steve, what's going on with Joel, man? I, I, I thought he was gonna be here by now. I've been waiting a long time. Wait, remix. Wait, 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 wait. Oh. <laughs> I still got the people waiting for me in the conference. You know, it's, it's, what, what is that? You ready? Don't tell me you need to prepare for this. I was born ready. Hey everybody, this week on the Vape Channel, what I wanted to do was usually, you know, we go and we have fun and we talk about stuff. But I said this in a video before, I wanted to bring in someone with a little more expertise. So I wanted to be a bit more serious. And for those of you at home that have uh, questions or have, uh, you know, have contemplated about certain things with uh, e-juice and e-liquid and stuff like that, I brought in backup and I brought in a very big specialist. This is Lou Ritter. Lou Ritter is the president of AIMSA, A-E-M-S-A. And we'll put that at the bottom of the screen. And we will not put a halo above his head right now. <laughs> Lou, thanks for coming and hanging out with us today. What is AIMSA? We have a lot of people, you know, and with our vape, with vape channel and with vape stores, we deal a lot with beginners and, you know, people that are looking into this. And there's a lot of misconceptions about vaping in general. So what exactly, where do you fit in with AIMSA? AIMSA is the American E-Liquid Manufacturing Standards Association. It's a professional trade association um, of, by, and for its members. So AIMSA is not out trying to tell the industry what to do. Um, we're, we're not trying to do anything with the market other than set an example, encourage, and educate. And we do a fair amount of ad advocacy at the federal level. So as a standards association, we came up with real manufacturing standards for e-liquid. And they're all on our website. You can go to aemsa.org, just click on the standards, and you'll see there are very specific details for the quality of the nicotine, how to make sure that the, the content of the nicotine is accurate in your final product, uh, laboratory environments, um, ways to have evidentiary documentation and traceability, packaging requirements for childproof caps and tamper evidence and information that needs to be on the labels, smear proof labels, waterproof barriers between your bottles and your packaging when you're going to mail something. We don't want to see something leak out and have a post office, a postal person, you know, have a concern, things like this. But every consumable that's manufactured commercially and sold on the market has some kind of regulations. These products have not been regulated. We set out to try to come up with some. Well, I think it also should go with saying that you're not just doing the AIMSA thing because it's like a job. I mean, it's sure you have a lot of qualities that, are, that make you have to do a lot of work, but you are actually a vapor yourself. I've known you for some years, and you are a vapor. <laughs> that, that I am. I mean, I'm no doubt. I, I vape and I enjoy it. I DIY my own liquids. Um, I'm a consumer. I'm, I have no financial interest in the industry, and it changed my life. I smoked for 33 years, and I found e electronic cigarettes, and I just became fascinated. And I just started learning more and more. And I met you back in the early days. I mean, back in the days of Elixir TV, I think is where we probably met. In a Elixir long TV. time ago. And it was back when Elixir TV was one of the only channels. Vape TV and Elixir TV were like the really the very first. Um, community vape channels. We had about 20, 30 people. It was the same people every single night. Mm. We used to have a blast and we would share information and learn from each other. And one thing led to another and next thing I know, Link was calling me up saying we should do We Are Vapors. And yeah. We Are Vapors hasn't gotten as far as long as, it, as we had hoped it would. But um, one thing led to another and one dinner, Link and I went out and invited some 
e-liquid manufacturers to dinner and said, what do you guys think about doing something like this? And it just kind of happened on its own. Link is Link Williams. He's the co-founder with Lou of Ames. Um, also, We Are Vapors, I believe, is a movie that he has. In it's, the a do- it's a documentary. He's got over 400 hours in the can. It's a monstrous project. Um, various <laughs> different pieces pulled in different directions, evolution of the industry, um, different participants losing a video editor in the process. Uh, AIMSA came up and that took over a lot of time. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, I mean, it, it, there, there's been some discussion about, you know, why is it taking so long, but the crowdfunding was, was only about $20,000 and there's no way to make a movie with $20,000. Right. You barely even get started. But we do have over 400 hours in the can. It is Link's project. And I, I think that Link will end up making something really unique and very special out of it, and especially now that the regulatory process is starting to unfold. So I think there's a lot more to the story that needs to be added into it. Mm-hmm. Well, as you and I both know, we've been vaping. I, like uh, Lou brought up, we've known each other for at least five years now. And <clears throat> the the evolution of vaping is ever-changing. It's, it's come a long way since when we first met a long time ago. But... A question that I have for you that I, I wish that I knew how to tell people is how can I not consider this a cessation device when I'm not smoking, when, you know, they, they have a lot of uh, regulatory mumbo jumbo because I don't know all the correct terminology for it. You can say it's not a cessation device and they say, well, it's got nicotine in it, but so does the patch and so do lozenges and gums and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. You have all these campaigns with the hashtag I'm proof and stuff out there. Is it, are we getting to the point where we can finally say? Well, in the proposed deeming rule, the answer is no. As a proposed deeming rule, in order to be considered a nicotine cessation device, there are certain requirements that it be proven. We know from, from experience and right. from the millions and millions of people all around the world that are <clears throat> switching from tobacco to vaping, mm-hmm. that it is causing smoking cessation. I mean, we're seeing declines in tobacco sales and cigarette sales, and we're seeing a market explosion that's completely unprecedented by one of the only consumer incentivized products in the world. So it is doing that, but does it meet the regulatory standards for being able to be marketed as a cessation device? Okay. That's a different technicality, and that's where we still have some more work to do in getting the government to accept it and recognize it and allow it to be marketed as that. Okay, hold on, I've got, I took notes. Remember you trying to teach me about Ohm's Law? If you wanna see someone grill me and take me to the woodshed on <laughs> Ohm's Law, this is the guy right here. Here's a couple of things that I wanted to go over. Um, I'm just gonna throw out some ingredients that could possibly be in e-juice or in e-liquid that I've covered in previous episodes mm-hmm. and I got almost crucified, uh, no offense. But uh, <laughs> diacetyl or diacetyl. Okay, so diacetyl is is a it's a compound. I mean, these flavors are complex combinations of, of many many different molecules. Diacetyl is is commonly found in buttery flavorings, and the first um, indications of uh, what's known as popcorn lung uh, has a technical name obliteritis something obliteritis I don't remember the, the technical name at the moment um, but there were manufacturers workers factory workers in popcorn factories where they were breathing heavy concentrations of this buttery flavoring that had diacetyl in it and they developed this this type of, of a bronchial obliteritis, I think it's called. Mm-hmm. Um, At and least. It's, it's considered what's called an autoimmune disease. So there are really no symptoms until, it, until you have it, and then there's no cure for it. And the only possible way to treat it is with a lung transplant, but because it's autoimmune, it could potentially come back and attack the replacement lung. The number of incidents of this disease are relatively small, and the level of concentration of what they were exposed to was very, very high. There may have been other factors which contributed. We don't know why certain factory workers developed this disease and other ones did not. I'm not a scientist. I'm not even going to guess at it. What we know from within this industry is butter flavor and diacetyl is not a problem for ingestion via digestion. You can eat it, it's not a problem. It's, it's in a, beer. It's, it's not a problem with it in beer. Long as you're, it goes you're to drinking, my it's going down to the stomach and it's getting digested. Getting exposed to the lungs by inhalation, that's a different story. And then we start looking at, we have different vapor profiles. Some people vape, like I, I'm being a, an experienced scuba diver, 
I know my lung capacity and where I'm breathing. When I inhale, I'm vaping. I'm vaping only the very, very top portion of my lung. But cloud chasers are taking the most massive possible inhalation, direct inhalation. They are taking in as much possible vapor, as deeply into their lungs as possible. If I were doing that, I'd want to know what am I inhaling into my lungs? What am I exposing myself to? I mean, that's a direct path into the bloodstream. Mm -hmm. And it's going through our lungs, which are a primary organ. I mean, that's the mechanism by which we get oxygen. And we can't live without oxygen. So if we mess up our lungs, we're messing up our life. Right. We're looking for tobacco harm reduction. We're not looking for harm elimination. But in this case, because it's a flavoring molecule and flavorings are recipes, it's an ingredient that can be omitted. It can be left out. And we just have to figure out and put enough pressure on the flavoring supply chain, whether it's the food flavoring supply chain to start testing at a batch level, or some we're starting to see indications of industry-specific supply chain where people are choosing to now manufacture flavorings based on the ingredients and focusing on potential health concerns and testing and showing the results with their product right from day one. Well, here's something that's funny. <clears throat> And um, I, I know Steve back there, he can, he can agree with me on this. A lot of this is debunking, and I did this video previously when I said that I, I basically I touched on everything, maybe not as eloquently and as wonderfully as you just did, but I did cover those bases. And what I did find out was about the popcorn factory and the mm -hmm. popcorn lung and all that stuff. And you, when you uh, gave your presentation earlier, you said three words that I, when I do my videos, whether you're a beginner vapor, whether you're an intermediate vapor, an enthusiast, a hobbyist, or someone who's thinking about trying to quit smoking, your best weapon, and in three words you said it best, was research is ammunition. And I thought to myself, that's exactly what I've been saying to anyone that listens to any of these videos that I put out, and I think that that's wonderful. Um, and for all of you who doubted me, there are a lot of vapors out there. Indeed. And with all the different vapors, like anything else, everybody's going to have their own point of view. Indeed. And I, I'm not here to try to say this one's right, that one's wrong. Right. What I'm concerned about is how do we advocate to keep these products available as a smoking alternative. Right. That's my number one goal. And I'm, I'm blessed to have a whole group of manufacturers who agree with me and support me to go and speak in front of the FDA and speak to OMB OIRA about these things. And they funded, they've dug into their own pockets and funded, we did what's called a plasma nicotine absorption level study. So in our sessions what? by going, to, yeah, in our sessions with going to, to the FDA, the second time we went to the FDA, we went and brought them, we, we it was clear from the first time that they didn't really know about refillables. So the second time we went back, we brought a whole array of products from Sigalikes all the way up to Proveris and Darwins and NDAs and everything in between, variable voltage, variable wattage, all, all of it. And we put it in sealed packages so they could see how it was sold to consumers and open so they could play with it. We brought Brandon Ward as a guest subject matter expert who was able to give them a representation of the evolution. Sorry, Brandon evolved evolution, I know. Um, but the evolution of these products and to the point now where <laughs> the electronics are providing additional safety features, undercharge, overcharge, protection, short circuit protection, all of that kind of stuff. That's basically batteries <clears throat> and hardware right. type stuff. But they ask questions in a listening session, they will ask questions about your presentation. They very rarely venture out beyond anything. It's a listening session for a reason. They're there to listen. But we heard that the, 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 the direction of the questions, things like, can your circuit board calculate flow rate. And so Brandon said, well, it depends on you know, how, the, how the mix of the liquid, but if we know what's in the liquid and its ratios and so forth, yes, we can give it. So why would someone at the FDA ask if a microprocessor on a device can calculate flow rate? Because they're trying to find out how much nicotine is getting into the blood. So we are also blessed to have Dr. Constantinos Farsalinos is one of our subject matter experts. So as soon as we got back from Washington, D.C., I jumped on the horn with Dr. Farsalinos and I said, is there a way we can do a study? If I can get the, our members to fund it, can you do a study that's going to go, and forget this flow rate stuff, let's just go to the source, let's go right to the bloodstream. Can we do it? Boom. He called me back two weeks later and he said, yes. He said, and we can do it quickly because there's another study that he could connect it with. And he, he went over the whole profiles. He said, we'll bring in a bunch of people for sigil likes after eight hours of abstinence. We'll, have them to, we'll take a blood draw as a baseline. He said, then we'll have them use a cigarette -like for five minutes, taking 10 puffs over five minutes to emulate a cigarette. Then we'll take a blood draw. Then we'll let them use that cigarette -like as much as they want for an hour, pulling blood every 15 minutes. 
Then we'll bring them in on another day and we'll give them an EVIC at nine watts. And we'll use the same 18 milligram juice across everything. We'll go send it to the lab, have it thoroughly, thoroughly analyzed so we can have it in the study to show exactly what is in the liquid. And we'll do exactly the same thing. And his results were amazing. I mean, you can use a Sigalike at 18 milligrams of liquid for almost an hour, and you're not going to get your blood nicotine level is not going to get as high as it will from one single tobacco cigarette. And this study is now published. You can see all this information on the Ames site. It's on Dr. Farsalino's site. His is e-cigarette-research.com, I think. Um, and he's got references to it on his site as well. We, we focus the direction based on, on the information that we learn, and we're all always learning. The question is, are we doing enough as an industry? And are we being responsible enough? And what can we get out in front of ahead of time rather than to wait and see? I mean, they, when AIMSA first launched, there were a lot of people that said, you, oh, you're bringing attention to this. And there's no doubt. I mean, when regulations come, we knew this two years ago, and we right. know it today. When regulations come, right now, they're saying that they're anticipating a total of 25 pre-market tobacco that would be PMTA, PM, pre-market tobacco authorization or application, they're anticipating a total of 25 applications based on the current version of the proposed deeming rule. And they say that they anticipate each one of those applications requiring 5,000 hours of preparation. Now, you have a store. You work at a store, right? I do. Okay. How many liquids, Not don't get into nicotine levels or anything else, but how many different liquids do you sell in your store? Flavoring-wise? Yeah. Flavoring, I'd say, we're on the plus side of 50. Okay, let's say 50. Yeah. So right, let's you have 50 liquids. Right there's 50 applications, right? Wow. These liquids are written applications, different product. Now, how many different nicotine levels do you have? Uh, does zero count? No, let's not count zero, because okay. zero's, counting... not, zero's not a tobacco okay. product. Uh, not counting zero, four. Okay, so you take your 50 and you multiply it by four. Now you're at 400 applications. 50 you're not a manufacturer. I don't know if you're a manufacturer or not, but but 50 times 4 is 200, right? Yeah, you said 4. Uh, 4. <laughs> it, it, Math. But 200, there's 200 applications right there. Okay. How many different diluent ratios do you have? PG, PG. Uh, two. Okay. So now you just doubled, Double your, that. Num you just doubled your number. 400. Four, now four, now we're 400. 400. But that's just you. If you're a manufacturer, if you were, man I don't know if you manufacture or if you're just reselling, but different, say, any product that's being manufactured is going to have to have that many applications. So if you have a manufacturer who's got 100 liquids, if he's got four different nicotine levels, there's 400 applications right there. And suppose he offers two or three different VGPG ratios. Right. Now you just multiplied that 400 times two or three, and that's just from that one. Now you consider you've got two to 3,000 e-liquid manufacturers out there. I mean, some, some of them have 200 products. And then you get into the diluent ratios and all the nicotine levels. So we're talking about thousands and thousands and thousands of applications. Okay. Easily, easily. And you know, it's going to be in the hundreds directions. of thousands of applications, wow. and they're anticipating 25. So, I mean, obviously that's the, the proposed deeming rule, right. and I think that they purposefully set it with a big hammer at the end because they didn't know what the process was going to right. happen, and they knew they needed to learn, and they are actively learning. There's an FDA workshop coming up in December that's going to go on for two days that's all about science, and they have very specific questions, and they want very specific scientists to come and talk about it. Of course, we're going. Of course, Dr. Farsalinas is going, uh, and you know we're, we're going to start to flush out some of these issues with, with the FDA. But we need to pay attention to what they're doing. We need to be paying attention to what we're doing as an industry, and doing what we can. This wait and see, you know, when AIMS launched, people were saying, oh, you're bringing attention to it. I mean, a lot of people refer to it as the ostrich approach. So now I'm going to come full circle. I'm going to come, come into, your, into your territory. Okay. Visualize for me for a second. <clears throat> An ostrich with its head in the sand. What's exposed? Das. So. Did I win? If we go like an ostrich and we put our head in the sand and we leave our butt exposed, there's a good chance that something very unpleasant is going to happen, right? We know it's coming, and the question is, what can we do to mitigate it? How can we be responsible? How can we answer some of the questions, address some of the concerns, and get out in front of this stuff before they have to do it for us? And that's really what AIMS is all about in the beginning. SFAT is doing an amazing job. AVA is doing an amazing job. CASA is doing it. And each one in their own different direction. And I applaud them all. But the industry itself has to start getting in front of some of these regulatory issues. Just pointing the finger and accusing the FDA, you did this, you said this, you're you, 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 you. It's not about them, it's about us. This right. is our industry, this is our product, our smoking alternative, this is for us. It, the responsibility is on us 
if we want to contribute and participate in this process and try to make sure that they don't have to do it for us. I'm trying to find an easy example, but for someone who really finds that they enjoy this, but they don't have the resources or, you know, maybe knowledge or something, but they want to go support, how would someone who, say, is watching this video at home, what would you recommend they do? Number one, don't be afraid to get involved. And if you sit at home and just say, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, that's what happens. We have these hearings come up, and very often we see story after story, state-level hearings, city-level hearings, whatever, and two vendors show up and five consumers show up. Um, I mean, there's plenty of advocacy organizations out there that will give you information. You can go and call up, contact the people at CASA, contact people at SFADA. The SFADA is setting up state-level operations, trying to get, get offices around the country to help with these exact questions. you got people like the Vaping Militia. You've got the American Vaping Association. Tennessee's got a new association going on. There are different state organizations, associations that are developing all over the place. AIMS has not really advocated at the state level. Right. We just don't have the manpower. Our focus is at the federal level. But there are plenty of people who are focusing on the state level. It gets a little bit complicated because there are different motivations at the city level. Do they have accurate information? If you bring the science and the accurate information at the date of the hearing, are you going to change anything? Is there any chance they already made their decision? How much of this is politics? There's a lot of different issues in here that muddy the waters, so there isn't a clean and simple answer to the question. The best answer is get involved. Try to create an organization to respond to calls of action when they come out of places like CASA and SFADA and the AVA. I mean, Greg Connolly is a wealth of knowledge. Some of the people that, that are doing CASA and, and vaping militia, these guys understand what's going on. They understand some of the local markets or the state level issues that are going on, and they have have speaking points. So if you have questions, get yourselves together. Don't barrage these people with a thousand different people calling all with the same question. All right. Create a, 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 some kind of organization, network amongst yourselves to share information, and then your group can have one outreach to CASA, another outreach to Vaping Militia, and ask, say, we've got this coming up in our state, how can we be prepared? What are some of the speaking points? One thing I'll tell you right now, dress professionally or at least appropriately you know nice at least a collared shirt don't go in there with torn shredded clothes how about orange Shave. shoes there's nothing wrong with orange shoes but you know i mean just <laughs> to be a little bit respectful of the fact that it is a professional environment don't well, don't vape in, in during a hearing you're gonna lose a drip tip yep. um but don't don't you know be respectful if you if you feel a need to vape <clears throat> Either take a package of snooze with you and, and, and do that, or step out and go have your vape outside. But I mean, I, I saw, heard about hearings in New York where people were just blowing clouds in the middle of the hearing. And you, how are you going to expect them to respect you if you don't respect them? At first, it seems like it's kind of a good idea, like an act of defiance. <clears throat> but you, you figure they're giving you their time, and they're going to try and listen to you. Don't rub it in their face. Try and make it worth your while. Well, they're, 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 they're there to be representatives of the public, and right. they're supposed to be acting in the best interest, and they're supposed to be doing things that are protectful of the overall industry. But right. if you want their attention, just like anybody else, if, to, if you want someone's attention, you have to be somewhat respectful of them and their time and, and their focus. And, and blowing clouds is a disrespectful act. It's, you know, I mean, we're, this is, is not, uh, what's, that, what's that show, the, the, the show of Anarchy, something Anarchy? Sons of Anarchy? Sons of Anarchy. You know, I mean, they, we're not the Sons of Anarchy. You know, we're, that's not who we are. We, we are people who our lives have been changed from smoking that was killing us to something that is way less harmful and it's making a big difference and, to, and, and, and it can continue to make a difference but if we want them to respect us, we have to go to them with real information. If we just go say, don't do this, don't do that, don't do the other thing, and we don't provide them any recommendations, we don't give them any solutions, you've got to go in and say, well, you know, the things that you're doing aren't based on facts. Here are the facts. You know, we realize these are concerns. They're legitimate concerns, but there are factual answers. There's been studies that have been done. There's verified information. Let's not make premature decisions based on supposition and, and, and speculation. Let's do it based on the facts. Where's the science? Where's the real, provable, verifiable truth? I feel smarter just talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> but if you bring that full circle on yourself, define the facts, 
research is ammunition because they yes. are out there if you look and it's we live in a in a digital age where it's out there if you look hard enough you can find it you don't even have to look very hard these yeah. organizations all have it the AIMSA website just go to the links page there's a whole bunch of research right there CASA has all kinds of information svada has got all kinds of information all these organizations that we've been building volumes and volumes of information all, all people have to do is ask for it it's just Having a hundred people call and ask the same question, frankly, I'm putting in 12 to 14 hour days. Right. I don't have time for a hundred phone calls a day to answer the same question. If people get together and say, hey, we've got a group of people down in, in Arizona, we're looking for some information, can you point us in a direction? Who can we speak to? Where can we get some information that we can take? What are some of the speaking points? We may refer you over to Vaping Militia, we may refer you to Kassad, depending on the nature of the question, mm -hmm. we'll try to point you in the direction of who's got the most focus on that. And who's can answer it the most accurately. Alcohol and your juice. There are some alcohols that are used as thinners. It, I don't want to get into a whole education level here, but generally, the less you put in, the better. I mean, the better, less of anything you put in. VG, PG, nicotine, flavoring. Try to test your flavoring. Okay. Try to keep everything else out if you can. Okay. Um, placebos. I'm talking caffeine. I'm talking vitamins. I'm talking stuff like that in your juice. There's no evidence that it does absolutely anything. And again, it's things that we don't know about. You're putting them in there. You're just raising potential concerns for regulators. There's no reason for it to be in there. It doesn't give you the same boost that drinking the caffeine does. Mm -hmm. Why put in a bunch of stuff that doesn't need to be in there and it's just gonna make the regulatory process that much more complicated and even complicate science that much more. If people randomly start buying bottles to test them to see what's in them and they find a whole bunch of stuff in there that doesn't need to be in there, it's just going to make regulation that much harder and we, we, we weaken our own arguments by putting stuff in the juice we just don't need. Whole tobacco alkaloids. Whole tobacco alkaloids. It is something that can potentially help people with, with uh, getting away from tobacco. Um, we have met, when we first launched AIMS, so there were a lot of concerns about whole tobacco alkaloids. AIMS is a verification organization. We verify everything, absolutely everything. And none of our members, we're a trade association for our members, of by and for our members, none of them use whole tobacco alkaloids. And they vote on their own standards. So nothing gets imposed on them. If we have an amendment to the standards, they vote. And, and, and that's how a new standard gets, gets, gets adopted. But Link Williams and I met with the um, manufacturers, the two the, at the time, I don't know how many there are now, there were two primary manufacturers of whole tobacco alkaloids. When we launched them, so we went and sat down with both of them. And we said, we have no problem with your product, and it, we, it may help people, but we are a verifications organization. And every one of our members has to show us certificates of analysis on every single batch of nicotine. USP certified to launch through the chain of custody, nothing's going to change. Whole tobacco alkaloids is an extraction process from tobacco, and we need to see the science. We need to have certificates of analysis, quantitative GCMS tests, and that's the starting place. G what? GCMS, quantitative GCMS. It's, a, it, it, it's an analysis. It's a thorough analysis of, the, of, of what's in that product. Okay. It's a laboratory analysis that tells you what's in it. Just like we have certificates of analysis that show us what's in the nicotine, mm -hmm. and it's required every single batch. We said in order for AIMSA to have this discussion, step one is you have to give us a certificate of analysis, a quantitative GCMS report of your product to show to our subject matter experts. We're not the experts, but we have the experts. Dr. Constantinos Farsalinos, Gene Gilman, Kurt Kistler, Richard Soterra, and we've got people that, that are experts that know what this stuff is. And they, <clears throat> they said, we're not gonna give it to you, it's trade secret. And we said, okay, well, we cannot embrace it, we cannot support it, we cannot say anything I've... about it because we don't <laughs> know what's in it. So we're, not, you know, it's it's not like we're against whole tobacco alkaloids. Alkaloids. We are a verifications organization for our own members. None of them use it, and we're not going to spend money testing other people's product. Right. That's unprofessional. It's inappropriate, and our members don't want their dues money spent testing somebody else's product. If they want it to, it to be considered and discussed, we will be happy to discuss it. We won't even charge you to bring it to our next subject matter experts. Bring us the science, real quantitative GCMS that are current current you know batch level type stuff and if it's going to be considered by him it's going to be a batch level evidentiary documentation that's going to be required every single batch just like the nicotine is and that's where the conversation begin, can begin other than that we cannot consider it because we we're not going to embrace something that we don't verify when we verify everything so you know i mean but also people that like whole tobacco alkaloids you can buy the whole tobacco alkaloids and add them to any liquid that you mm -hmm. want 
You know, I mean, we're not saying it's don't do it. It's a true story. It. He says it so much better than me. <laughs> I have. <laughs> I'm blown today. That was awesome. Well, that was a lot for you to digest, but the good news is you can rewind it and you can go back over anything that you missed. Um, I want to thank Lou, Lou Ritter. Thank you very much, Lou. I love Joel. you very much. Click on the links. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's always good to see you, Joel. All right. Keep it real. Keep it fresh. Keep it real fresh. And I got to go.